Book 13. Assault on the ships When Zeus had brought great Hector and his Trojans into the beachhead by the ships, he left them to cruel toil of battle, and to grief, while he himself with shining eyes turned north, gazing on the far lands of Thracian horsemen, Mysoi, hand-to-hand -hand fighters, Hippomolgoi, who live on mare's milk, nomads, Abioi, most peaceable and just of men. And Zeus now kept his shining eyes away from Troy, confident that no other god would come to take a hand for Trojans or Danans. But the strong god who makes the mainland shake had not been blind. Enthralled, watching the battle, he sat on woody Samos' highest ridge off Thrace, whence Ida could be seen in Tyre and Priam's town and the Achaean ships. He had climbed up from the salt sea, and now he pitted Achaeans beaten down by Trojans. Rancha within him deepened against Zeus. Then from the stony mountain down he went with mighty strides, a tremor shook the crags and forest under Poseidon's immortal feet. Three giant steps, then four, and he was home at Agai, where his golden chambers glimmer in the green depth and never wash away. Here he entered, into his chariot shafts he backed his racing team with golden manes, put on his golden mantle, took his whip of pliant gold, stepped up into his car, and rolled out on the waves. Great fish beneath him gambled from every quarter of the deep, aware their lord rode overhead, in laughter white caps parted, and the team full tilt airily drew unwetted the axle tree, with leap on leap they bore him toward the beachhead. There is a cavern deep in the deep sea midway between the rocky isle of Imbros and Tenedos, here he who shakes the islands drove his horses down, unharnessed them, tossed them heavenly fodder, looped their hocks with golden hobbles none could break or slip, that they should abide here their lord's return, and off he went to the Achaean army. Now like a storm or prairie fire, swarming steadily after Hector son of Priam, the Trojans roared as one man, on the verge, they thought, of capturing the Achaean ships and dealing death to the best men around them. But now from the deep water, girdler of earth and shaker of earth, Poseidon came to arouse new spirit in the Argives. Calchas he seemed, with his unwearied voice, addressing first those two, fiery as he, the men named Aias, Aias and Aias, fight to save the Achaean army. Joy of action is what you must remember, and have done with clammy dread. Elsewhere I do not fear the free spear arms of Trojans, though they've crossed our big rampart in force. They can be held, all of them, by Achaeans. Only here, in this one place, I am most afraid it will go badly for us. Here this madman, Hector, like a conflagration leads them, bragging he is a child of almighty Zeus. I wish you were inspired by some god to hold the line hard, clamped hard here, you too, rallying others, you could block and turn his whirlwind rush away from the long ships, even if the Olympian sets him on. The god who girdles earth, even as he spoke, struck both men with his staff, instilling fury, making them springy, light of foot and hand. Then upward like a hawk he soared, a hawk that, wafted from a rock point sheer and towering shoots to strike a bird over the plain, so arrowy in flight Poseidon left them. The son of Oileus knew his nature first and turned to say to the son of Telamon, that was one of the gods who hold Olympos, here in the seer's shape telling us to fight above the ships. It was not Calchas, not the reader of bird flight, from his stride, his legs as he went off, I knew him for a god. The gods are easily spotted. As for me, I feel more passion to do battle now, I tingle from the very soles of my feet to my fingertips. And Telamonian Ias answered, so it is with me, my hands itch to let the spears half fly. Power is rising in me, I can feel a springing freshness in my legs. I long to meet this implacable Hector face to face. So they assured each other, in that joy of battle which the god inspired, and he meanwhile put heart in the Achaean soldiers rearward, taking a respite among the ships. Dead on their feet from toil of war, these men were losing heart, now they could see the Trojans massing as they crossed the rampart. Watching, in silence the Achaeans' eyes grew wet, they saw no way to escape the evil hour. But he who makes the islands tremble, passing lightly among them, stiffened the backbone of all those rugged companies. Tucros first and Latos he commanded as he came, then Penelios and Thoas, Dapiros, and last Meriones and Antilochos, Clarion in battle. Urgently and swiftly he cried to them, Shame, Argives, shame, young men. By fighting you can save our ships, but if you shirk the battle, then we face defeat this day at the Trojans' hands. By heaven, what a thing to see! I never dreamed the war would come to this, our beachhead raided by Trojans. Until now those men were timorous as greenwood deer, like fair for jackals, leopards, wolves, wandering deer with no fight in them and no joy in battle. Trojans in other days would never meet Achaean power on the attack, not they. 
Far from the city now, they press the combat to the very ships, by our commander's fault and by our soldier's fault in giving in. At odds with him, our men will not hold fast beyond the ships, but die around them. Call it proved and true beyond a doubt that Agamemnon, lord of the great plains, caused this by contempt shown to Achilles. Are we to break off battle, then? How can we? Rather, find a remedy, good men's hearts respond to remedies. You must no longer hang back, but attack, for honor's sake, as every one of you is a first-rate soldier. Would I now quarrel with one who shunned the war if he were a man unfit for it? No. With you, I am full of anger. Soldiers, you'll bring on worse things yet by your half-heartedness. Let each man get a fresh grip on his pride and look to his standing. The great contest begins, Hector begins his drive along the ships in force, he has broken the gate bar and the gate. In terms like these Poseidon stirred the Achaeans, and round the two named Aias they made stand, hard companies the war god would not scorn, nor would Athena, hope of soldiers. Gathering, picked men faced the Trojan charge, faced Hector, spear by spear and shield by shield in line with shield rims overlapping, serried helms, and men in ranks packed hard, their horsehair plumes brushed one another when the shining crests would dip or turn, so dense they stood together, as from bold hands the spear's hafts, closing up, were pointed, quivering. And the men looked ahead, braced for battle. Trojans massed and running charged them now, with Hector in the lead in furious impetus, like a rolling boulder a river high with storm has torn away from a jutting bank by washing out what held it, then the brute stone upon the flood goes tossed and tumbling, and the brush gives way, crashing before it. It must roll unchecked as far as level ground, then roll no more, however great its force had been. So Hector threatened at first to sweep clear to the sea through huts and ships of the Achaeans, killing along the way, but when he reached the line of packed defenders he stopped dead in his tracks. His adversaries lunging out with swords and double-bladed spears beat him away, so that he stepped back, shaken. Then he cried, Trojans, Lycians, Dardans, fight hard here. They cannot hold me, not for long, by making Bastion, closed in line together. No, I can see them break before the spear, if it is sure I have the first of gods behind me, Heros consort, lord of thunder. Shouting, he cheered them on to the attack, and Priam's son, Daphobos, inflamed by a great hope, moved out ahead, his round shield forward as he trod, cat-like. Compact behind it. Then Meriones took aim and cast his shining spear. A direct hit on the round shield of bull's hide, but no breakthrough, the long haft snapped off at the blade. Daphobos had held his shield before him at arm's length to counter that hard blow. And now Meriones retired amid his company, full of rage to see spearhead and victory broken off. Rearward he went, along the huts and ships, to get a long spear left inside his hut. The rest fought on, with long-drawn battle cries, and Telamonian Tucros drew first blood by killing a son of Mentor, herder of horses, Imbrios the pikeman. He had lived at Podios before the Achaeans came and had a young wife, Medesicus, born of a slave to Priam. When the rolling ships of the Danans beached, he journeyed back to Ilion, stood high, and lived near Priam, who ranked him with his own sons. Two crows gashed Imbrios under the ear with his long weapon, then withdrew it. Down the Trojan went, as on a hilltop, visible far and wide, an ash hewn by an axe puts down its verdure shimmering on the ground. So he went down, and round him clanged his harness wrought in bronze. Two crows rushed in to strip him, as he did so, Hector aimed a thrust with his bright spear, but the alert man swerved before the point, escaping by a hair's breadth. Hector hit a son of Cteato's Actorides, Amphimarchos, with a spear thrust in the chest just as he joined the fight. He thudded down and his armor clanged upon him. Hector lunged to pull away the brave man's fitted helm, and Aias reached for Hector with his spear, but nowhere shone his bare flesh, all concealed by his grim armor. Aias hit his shield boss hard and forced him backward, making Hector yield the dead. Achaeans drew them off. Stichios and Menestheus, in command of the Athenians, bore Amphimarchos amid the Achaeans. As for Imbrios, one Aias and the other, fast and bold, took him as lions carry off a goat under the noses of a biting pack into a forest undergrowth, aloft, clear of the ground, they lug him in their jaws. Just so, with tossing plumes like manes, these two lugged Imbrios, and stripped him of his gear. Then from his tender neck Aias Oileades, in anger for Amphimarchos, lopped his head and bowled it through the melee till it tumbled in dust at Hector's feet. Poseidon, too, grew hot over Amphimarchos, his grandson. 
Passing amid the huts and ships, he kindled fire in Danans and devised Trojans' woe. Idomeneus now crossed his path, just come from a fellow captain slash behind the knee, who had been helped by others from the battle. Idomeneus had commended him to the surgeons and made his way now to his hut, he longed once more to join the fighting. The earthshaker addressed him in the form and voice of Thoas, and Draymond's son, who ruled all Pluran, all that steep land, Caledon of Aetolians, where country folk revered him as a god. As Thoas, now Poseidon said, Idomeneus, Marshal and mind of Cretans, what has become of those Achaean threats against the Trojans? The Cretan captain in reply said, Thoas, the blame cannot be pinned on any man, so far as I know, up to now. Our people understand war, none is unmanned by fear, not one has lagged or slipped away from carnage. Only it must be somehow to the pleasure of Aragon Zeus, that hearing gloriously far from Argos the Achaeans perish. Ah, Thoas. Before this you have shown courage in danger, and when you see a man go slack, you brace him. No quitting now. Let every soldier hear it. Poseidon answered him, Idomeneus, let that man never voyage home from Troy but be a carcass for the dogs to play with who would give up the fight this day. Come on, and bring your gear, no time to lose, we must hit hard and hit together, both of us, if we are going to make our presence felt. When feeble men join forces, then their courage counts for something. Ours should count for more, since we can fight with any. So the god took part with men once more in toil of combat. When he had reached his hut, Idomeneus bound on his handsome armor, took two spears, and ran out like a lightning bolt, picked up by Zeus to handle nickering on Olympos when he would make a sign to men, the jagged dance of it blinding bright. So as he ran bronze flashed about his breast. Meriones, his valiant aide, came up, still near the hut, on his way to get a bladed spear to carry, and mighty Idomeneus said, Meriones, Molo's dear son, good runner, best of friends, how is it that you left the battle? Have you been hit? Some arrow grinding in you? Or were you bringing word to me? No sitting still in huts for me, I long to fight. The cool man said, Idomeneus, counselor of battlecraft to Cretans under arms, I came to see if any spear is left here I can use. I shattered mine just now against Daphobo's shield. Idomeneus answered, Spears? All you desire, twenty-one spears, you'll find inside, arrayed against the bright wall of the entranceway, all Trojan, I win weapons from the dead. I do not hold with fighting at long range, therefore I have the spears, and shields as well, and helms as well, and bright-faced cuirasses. Mary owns the cool man in reply said, in my quarters, at my ship, I too have plenty of Trojan gear, not near at hand, though. I say I am not, not, I say, a man to pass up any attack. I take my place in the front rank for action and for honor whenever battles joined. There may be others who have not seen me fight, but I believe you know me. And the captain of Cretans answered, Know you, and how you stand. Why need you say it? Suppose amid the ships we picked our best for a surprise attack, that is the place where fighting qualities in truth come out, and you can tell a brave man from a coward. This one's face goes greener by the minute, he is so shaky he cannot control himself but fidgets first on one foot, then the other, his teeth chattering, his heart inside him pounding against his ribs at shapes of death foreseen. As for the brave man, his face never changes, and no great fear is in him, when he moves into position for an ambuscade, his prayer is all for combat. Hand to hand, and sharp, and soon. Well, no man then would look down on your heart and fighting skill. And were you hit by a missile or a thrust in the toil of war, the blow would never come from behind on nape or back, but in the chest or belly as you waded into give and take at the battle line. But no more talk or dawdling here like children. Someone might sneer and make an issue of it. Go to my hut and choose a battle spear. Mary owns, peer of ours, in a flash picked from the hut a bladed spear and ran after Idomeneus, a thirst for battle. Imagine ours, bane of men, when he goes into combat with rout close behind, his cold and powerful son, who turns the toughest warrior in his tracks. From Thrace these two take arms against Ephiroi or gallant Phlegiae, but not for them to heed both sides, they honor one with glory. Just so, Mary owns an Idomeneus, helmed in fiery bronze, captains of men, made their way to battle. But Mary owns asked his friend, son of Deucalion, where do you say we join the combat? On the right, or in the center, or on the left. I find the Achaeans there, if anywhere, shorthand in this attack. 
And the Cretan captain said, The middle ships have their defenders, Ias Telamonios, Ias Oileades, Tucros, our best hand with a bow, and brave at close quarters. They will give Hector more than he can handle in this battle, hot as he is for war. He's powerful, yes, but he will find it uphill work to conquer these sharp fighters, formidable hands, and set our ships aflame, unless Lord Zeus should toss a firebrand aboard himself. No mortal nourished on Demeter's meal, none vulnerable to bronze or stones will make great Telamonian Ias yield. He would not in a stand-up fight give ground to dire Achilles, whom in a running fight no man can touch. This way for us, then, to the army's left, to see how soon we'll give some fellow glory or win it from him. Swift as the god of war, Mary Ones was off, and led the way to that part of the line his friend required. When the Achaeans saw Idomeneus in fresh strength, like a flame, with his companion, richly armed, all gave a shout and grouped about him, and a great fight, hand to hand, arose at the ship's sterns. Gusts of crying wind on days when dust lies thickest on the lanes will wrestle and raise a dust cloud high, so spread this melee as men came together, sworn with whittled bronze to kill and strip each other. Bristling spines of long flesh-tearing spears went home in the deadly press, and a man's eyes failed before the flash of brazen helmets, cuirasses like mirrors, and bright shields in sunlight clashing. Only a man of iron could have looked on light-hearted at that fight and suffered nothing. At cross-purposes, the sons of Kronos in their power brought on bitter losses and death for brave men. Zeus on the one hand willed for Hector and the Trojans victory, to vindicate Achilles, at the same time, he willed no annihilation of the Achaeans before Troy, but only honour to the Tees and her lion-like son. Poseidon for his part now roused the Argives, moving among them, after he emerged in secret from the Grey Sea, being grieved by Argive losses at the Trojans' hands, he felt bitter indignation against Zeus. Both gods were of the same stock, had one father, but Zeus had been firstborn and knew far more. In giving aid, Poseidon therefore would not give it openly, always under cover, in a man's likeness, he inspired the ranks. These gods had interlocked and drawn an ultimate hard line of strife and war between the armies, none could loosen or break that line that had undone the knees of many men. Idomeneus belied his grizzled head and, calling on Danans, with a bound scattered the Trojans, for he killed Arthrianius of Cabesos, a guest of Troy. This man had come, on hearing lately of the war, and bid for Cassandra, the most beautiful of Priam's daughters. Though he had brought no gifts, he promised a great feat, to drive from Troy the army of Achaeans, willy-nilly. Then old Priam had agreed to give her, nodding his head on it, so the man fought confident in these promises. Idomeneus aimed at him with long spear flashing bright and caught him in mid-stride. His plate of bronze could not deflect the point driven in his belly, and down he crashed. The other taunted him, Arthrianius, I'll sing your praise above all others, if you do your part for Priam. He had promised you his daughter. Well, we could promise, and fulfil it, too, to give you Agamemnon's loveliest daughter brought out of Argos for you as your bride, if you would join to plunder Troy. Come, and we'll make the marriage bond aboard the long ships. There's no parsimony in us when it comes to bridal gifts. With this, he dragged him by one foot out of the combat. Asios, now dismounted, moved up fast to fight over the body, while his driver held the horses panting at his shoulders. Putting his heart into the cast, he tried to hit Idomeneus, but the Achaean whipped his missile in a head and struck his throat under the chin, running him through with bronze. Tall Asios fell the way an oak or poplar falls, or a towering pine, that shipbuilders in mountain places with fresh wetted axes fell to make ships timber. So, full length, he lay before his team and chariot, wheezing, clutching at the bloody dust. His stunned driver had lost what wits he had and did not dare to break from his enemies by wheeling his team around. Antilochos put a spear into him. The bronze he wore could not deflect the point driven in his belly, and with a gasp he pitched down from the car. His team was taken by Antilochos, great-hearted Nestor's son, amid the Achaeans. Enraged at Asio's fall, Daphobos went for Idomeneus with a hard spear cast, but he foresaw the blow and dodged the point by disappearing under his round shield of bull's hide, fitted on two struts or bars, and plated with concentric rings of bronze. Under this he packed himself, as over it the bronze-shod spear passed, and his shield rang out under the glancing blow. But not for nothing thrown by Daphobos' brawny hand, the spear hit a commander, Hypsona son of Hippasos, in the liver under the diaphragm and brought him tumbling down. Daphobos gave a great shout and exulted, Asios is down, but there's revenge. 
On his journey to death's iron gate he will be glad I gave him company. This went home to the Argives, most of all Antilochos, whose heart was stirred, but in his grief he still bethought himself for his companion. On the run he reached him, straddled him, and held his shield above him. Two other friends, Machistius, Echio's son, and brave Alaster, bent to lift and carry him groaning deeply to the sheltering ships. Idomeneus' passion for battle never waned, he strove to shroud some Trojan in hell's night or else himself to fall, as he fought off the black hour for Achaeans. Now he met Alcathus, Azeet's noble son, Anchises' son-in-law. This man had married Hippodamea, eldest of the daughters, dearest to her father and gentle mother in their great hall. In beauty, skill, and wit, she had excelled all girls of her own age. For this reason, too, the man who won her had been the noblest suitor in all Troy. Now it was he that by Idomeneus' hand Poseidon overcame. The god entranced his shining eyes and hobbled his fine legs, so that he could not turn back or maneuver, but like a pillar or a full-grown tree he stood without a tremor. Square in the chest Idomeneus caught him, sundering the cuirass that until now had saved his flesh from harm. And now at last he cried aloud, the rending spear between his ribs, and down he crashed, his heart, being driven through, in its last throes making the spear but quake. The mighty war god then extinguished all his force. Idomeneus yelled and exulted savagely, Ah, then, Daphobos, shall we call it quits when three are down for one? You counted first. Bright soul, come forward now, yourself, and face me. Learn what I am. I come in the line of Zeus, who fathered Minos, lord of the Cretan seas, and he in turn fathered Deucalion who fathered me, commander of many fighters in the wide land of Crete. Then here to Troy my ships brought me to plague you and your father and all the Trojans. Challenged so, Daphobos weighed the choice before him, should he pair with some brave Trojan, going back to get him, or take Idomeneus on alone. It seemed more promising to him to join Aeneas, whom he discovered in the battle's rear, standing apart, resentful against Priam, as Priam slighted him among his peers. Daphobos reached his side and said to him swiftly, Counselor of Trojans, you must come defend your kinsman, if his death affects you. Follow me, to protect Alcathus, your sister's husband, who made you his ward when you were still a small child in his house. The great spearman, Idomeneus, brought him down. The appeal aroused Aeneas. Craving battle, he charged Idomeneus, and he, no child to be overtaken by a qualm of fear, steadily waited, like a mountain boar who knows his power, facing a noisy hunt in a lonely place, his backbone bristles rise, both eyes are fiery, gnashing his tusks he waits in fury to drive back dogs and men. Idomeneus, great spearman, so awaited without a backward step Aeneas' onset. But to his friends he called out, looking back at Aphareus, Ascalaphos, Dapiros, and those two masters of the battle cry, Meriones and Antilochos, he sent an urgent cry to alert them, this way, friends. Give me a hand here, I am alone. I have a nasty fear of the great runner, Aeneas, now upon me, he has power to kill, and has the bloom of youth that is the greatest strength of all. If we were matched in ages in our spirit in single fight, then quickly he or I should bear away the glory. As he spoke, with one mind all the others closed around him, taking position, shields hard on their shoulders. Aeneas, too, on his side turned and called Daphobos and Paris and Agenor, fellow captains of Trojans. Troops moved up behind him now, as a flock out of a pasture follows a ram to drink, and the shepherd's heart rejoices, so did Aeneas' heart rejoice to see the men-at-arms follow his lead. Both masses came together, hand to hand, around Alcathus, long polished spears halved crossing, and the bronze on the men's ribs rang like anvils from the blows they aimed at one another. Most of all, those peers of ours, Aeneas and Idomeneus, strove with heartless bronze to rend each other. Aeneas made the first throw, but his adversary saw the aim and twisted to elude it, so that Aeneas' point went home in earth and stuck with quivering shaft, the force he gave it with his great arm spent on the air. Idomeneus for his part thrust and hit Oinomau's midbelly, breaking through his cuirass joint, and the bronze lance head spilt his guts like water. Dropping in dust, the Trojan clawed the ground. Idomeneus pulled his long spear out, but could not strip the Trojan's shoulders of his gear, being driven back by spear throws. And then, too, he was no longer certain of his footwork in lunging or recovery, but fought defensively against the evil hour, his legs no longer nimble in retreat. Now as he gave way step by step, Daphobos, implacable against him, made a throw but missed again, he hit Ascalaphos, a son of the god Ars, running him through the shoulder with his heavy spear. He fell in dust and clawed the ground. 
and Roaring Ars heard no news as yet that his own son died in that melee, no, for he was sitting on high Olympos under golden clouds, restrained by the will of Zeus, as were the other immortal gods, all shut away from war. But hand to hand around Ascalaphos the fight went on, Daphobos took the dead man's helm, but Meriones, fast as the war god, leaped and speared the Trojan's outstretched arm. The crested helm fell with a hollow clang, and with a falcon's pounce Mary Owens regained his spear and jerked it from Daphobo's upper arm at the shoulder joint, then back he turned to merge into his company. A brother of the wounded man, Polites, putting an arm around his waist, withdrew him out of the battle din to where his team stood waiting in the rear, with car and driver. Away to Troy they bore Daphobo's, who groaned in his distress, while blood ran down his arm from the open wound and still the others fought as the long-drawn battle cry arose. Lunging at Aphareus, son of Calata, Aeneas hit his throat as he turned toward him and cut it with his sharp spearpoint, the head fell to one side as shield and helm sank down and death, destroyer of Orida, flooded him. Antilocho's sharp eye on Thune saw him turn away, and in one leap he slashed the vein that running up the back comes out along the neck, he sheared it from the body, so that the man fell backward in the dust with arms out to his friends. Antilocos closed to take the harness from his shoulders watchfully, as the Trojans from all sides moved up and struck at his broad glittering shield. But none with his cold-hearted bronze could scratch Antilocos' tender skin, because Poseidon protected him amid those many blows. And never out of range of them he turned and turned upon his enemies, the spears half swerving, never still, with his intent to throw it and bring someone down or to close in and kill. Now Aetio's son Adamas caught him as he aimed and struck him, stepping in close, driving his point midshield, but felt the spear's half broken by Poseidon, who grudged him this man's life. One half the spear hung like a fire-hardened stake impaled in the shield of Antilocos, while on the ground the other half lay. Then Adamas backed into his throng of friends, away from death, but as he drew away, Mary owned went after him and hit him with a spear throw low between genitals and navel, there where pain of war grieves mortal wretches most. The spear transfixed him. Doubled up on it, as a wild bullock in the hills will writhe and twitch when herdsmen fetter and drag him down, so did the stricken man, but not for long before Mary Owens bent near and pulled out spearhead from flesh. Then night closed on his eyes. Now with his Thracian broadsword Helenos cut at Dapiro's head and broke his helm off, buffeted to the ground and underfoot it rolled till an Achaean fighter caught it, but black night closed on Dapiro's eyes. Grief at his death took great lunged Menelos, and menacing with hefted spear he bore down on Lord Helenos, while Helenos drew arrowhead to hand grip. All at once one made his cast, the other man let fly, and Priam's son hit Menelos' breast upon his armor's rondure, but the barbed shaft went skittering. On a threshing floor one sees how dark-skinned beans or chickpeas leap from a broad shovel under a sharp wind at the toss of the winnower, just so from shining Menelos' cuirass now the bitter arrow bounced up and away. Meanwhile the son of Atreus, clarion in battle, struck the hand that held the bow, he drove his brazen spearhead through the knuckles into the bow stave. Helenos recoiled amid his countrymen, eluding death, his dangling left hand dragging the ashwood spear. Great-hearted Agenor drew the spearhead out and bound his hand in sheep's wool from a sling and aid supplied him. Then came Paisandros in a rush at the great figure of Menelos, impelled by fatal destiny to fall before you in the melee, Menelos, and when the range narrowed between these two Menelos missed, the spear was turned aside, but Paisandros got home his stroke upon Menelos' shield. Only, he could not drive his metal in and through, the shield held fast, the shaft below the spearhead broke, yet even so in joy he hoped for victory. By the silver-studded hilt Menelos drew his longsword as he leapt on Paisandros, who now brought out from underneath his shield a double axe on a long polished helve. In one great shock both men attacked at once, axe head on helmet ridge below the crest came hewing down, but the sword stroke above the nose on the oncoming brow went home, it cracked the bone, and both his eyes were spilt in blood into the dust at his feet as he bent over and fell. Menelos followed to spurn the man's chest with his foot and strip his gear away. And glorying over him he said, here is the way back from the ships. This way you leave our beachhead, Trojans who have not yet enough of war. You don't lack vileness otherwise, or crime committed against me, you yellow dogs, you knew no fear of Zeus in his high thunder, lord of guests, no forethought of his anger harshly rising. He will yet destroy your craggy city for you. My true queen you carried off by sea with loads of treasure after a friendly welcome at her hands. This time you lust to pitch devouring fire into our deep sea ships, and kill Achaeans. You will be stopped somehow, though savage war is what you crave. 
Then in a lower tone he said, O Father Zeus, incomparable they say you are among all gods and men for wisdom, yet this battle comes from you. How strange that you should favour the offenders, favour the Trojans in their insolence ever insatiable for war. All things have surfeit, even sleep, and love, and song, and noble dancing, things a man may wish to take his fill of, and far more than war. But Trojans will not get their fill of fighting. Menelaus as he spoke had ripped away and given his men the dead man's blood-stained arms. Now once more, yet again, he entered combat. Here in a surge against him came Harpalion, King Pylamene's son, who journeyed with his father to make war at Troy, never thereafter to come home. At close quarters this fighter hit the shield of Menelaus, but he could not drive the bronze onward and through it. Backward in recoil he shrank amid his people, shunning death, with wary glances all around for anyone whose weapon might have nicked him. After him, though, Meriones let fly a bronze-shot arrow, and it punched through his right buttock, past the pelvic bone, into his bladder. On the spot he sank down on his haunches, panting out his life amid the hands of fellow soldiers, then he lengthened out like an earthworm as dark blood flowing from him stained the ground. Falling to work around him, Paphlagonians lifted him in a car and drove him back to Troy in sorrow. And his father, weeping, walked behind, there was no retribution for the dead son. But the death angered Paris, because among the Paphlagonians the man had been his guest and his great friend. In anger now he let an arrow fly. There was a young Achaean named Eukina, noble and rich, having his house at Corinth, a son of the visionary, Polyidos. When he took ship he knew his destiny, for Polyidos had foretold it often, he was to die of illness in his Megaron or else go down to death at Trojan hands amid the Achaean ships. Two things at once he had therefore avoided, the heavy fine men paid who stayed at home, and the long pain of biding mortal illness. Paris' arrow pierced him below jaw and ear, and quickly life ebbed from his body, the cold night enwrapped him. And the rest fought on like fire's body leaping. Hector had not learned that Trojans on their left flank near the ships were being cut to pieces, victory there was almost in Achaean hands, Poseidon urged them on so, and so lent them strength. But Hector held that ground where first he broke through gate and wall and deep ranks of Danans, there where the ships of Aeus and Protesilaus were drawn up on the grey sea beach, and land with the parapet had been constructed lowest. Here in chariots or on foot the Achaeans fought most bitterly, Boeotians, Ionians in long kittens, men of Locris, men of Thyre, illustrious Epeoi fought off Hector from the ships, but could not throw him back as he came on like flame. Athenians, picked men, were here, their chief PTO son, Menestheus, and his aides, Phaedus and Strichios, rugged bias. Next the Epeian leaders, Megs, son of Phileus, Amphion and Drachios, of Thyre then, Medon and staunch Podarx. I, this Medon, noble Oileus bastard son and Aias brother, lived in Philae far from his fatherland, as he had killed a kinsman of Oileus' second lady, Eriopis. As for the Lord Podarx, he was a son of Iphiclos Philokides. These, then, in arms before the men of Thyre, fought for the ships at the Boeotian side. But Aias, Oileus' quick son, would never, not for a moment, leave Telamonian Aias. These two men worked together, like dark oxen pulling with equal heart a bolted blow in fallow land. You know how, round the base of each curved horn, the sweat pours out, and how one smooth worn yoke will hold the oxen close, cutting a furrow to the field's edge? So these toiling heroes clove to one another. Surely the Telamonian had retainers, many and courageous countrymen, who took his shield when weariness came on him and sweat ran down his knees. No Locrians backed up the other Aias, Oileus' son, they could not have sustained close order combat, having no helms of bronze with horsehair crests, no round shields and no spears of ash. In fact, when they took ship together for Ilion, they put their faith in bows and braided sheep's wool slings, with which they broke the Trojan lines by pelting volleys. Now the men in armour fought with Trojans in the front lines, fought with Hector, hand to hand, but in the rear the bowmen shot, being safely out of range, and Trojans lost their appetite for battle as arrows drove them in retreat. At this, they might have left the ships and the encampment wretchedly to return to windy Troy, had not Pulidamas moved close to Hector, saying, You are a hard man to persuade. Zeus gave you mastery in arms, therefore you think to excel in strategy as well. And yet you cannot have all gifts at once. Heaven gives one man skill in arms, another skill in dancing, and a third man skill at gitten harp and song, but the Lord Zeus who views the wide world has instilled clear thought in yet another. By his aid men flourish, and there are many he can save, he knows better than any what his gift is worth. 
Let me tell you the best thing as I see it, now everywhere around you in a ring the battle rages. Ever since the Trojans crossed the wall, some have hung back, though armed, while others do the fighting, and these few, outnumbered, are dispersed along the ships. Give way, call all our captains back, we'll test their plans of action, every one. Shall we attack the deep sea ships, can we assume God wills to grant the day to us? And could we retire from the ships without a slaughter? As for me, I fear the Achaeans may still pay the debt they owe for yesterday, as long as the man we know, famished for battle, lingers on the beachhead, I doubt he'll keep from fighting any longer. This wariness won Hector's nod. At once down from his chariot he swung to earth, with all his weapons, and commanded swiftly, Pulidamas, it is up to you to call and hold our captains while I take on the battle over there. I will come back as soon as I have made my orders clear to them. And towering like a snow peak off he went with a raucous cry, traversing on the run Trojans and allied troops. Their officers collected near Pulidamas on hearing new commands from Hector. Daphobos, Lord Helenos, Adamas, son of Asios, and Asios, Hertico's son, were those he looked for down the front. Safe and unhurt he scarcely found them. Those who lost their lives at Argive hands were lying near the sterns, others were thrown back on the wall with wounds. But one man he soon found, on the left flank of Grievous battle, Prince Alexandros, husband of Helen of the Shining Hair. He stood there cheering on his company, and stepping near him Hector spoke to him in bitterness, Paris, you bad luck charm, so brave to look at, woman crazed, seducer, where is Daphobos? And Helenos? Asios, Hertico's son? Adamas, his son? Where is Arthrianius? If these are gone, tall Ilion is crumbling, sure disaster lies ahead. Alexandros replied, Hector, since you are moved to blame the blameless, there may be times when I break off the fighting, but I will not now. My mother bore me to be no milksop. From the hour you roused our men to battle for the ships we have been here engaging the Danans without respite. As for the friends you look for, some are dead. Daphobos and Helenos went off, I think, with spear wounds in the hand, but the Lord Zeus has guarded them from slaughter. Lead us now, wherever your high heart requires. We are behind you, we are fresh and lack no spirit in attack, I promise, up to the limit of our strength. Beyond that no man fights, though he may wish to. With these mild words he won his brother over. Into the thick of battle both men went, round Kebriones, Pulidamas, and Forks, Ortheos, godlike Polyphetes, Parmis, and the sons of Hippotion, Ascanios and Morris. These had come the day before at dawn, replacements from Ascanius Plowland. Zeus now intensified the fight. Men charged like rough winds in a storm launched on the earth in thunder of Father Zeus, when roaring high the wind and ocean rise together, swell on swell of clamorous foaming sea goes forward, snow crested, curling, ranked ahead and ranked behind, so line by compact line advance the Trojans glittering in bronze behind their captains. Hector in the lead, peer of the man-destroying god of war, held out his round shield, thick in bull's hide, nailed with many studs of bronze, and round his temples his bright helmet nodded. Fainting attack now here, now there, along the front, he tried the enemy to see if they would yield before his shielded rush, but could not yet bewilder the tough hearts of the Achaeans. Aias with a giant stride moved out to challenge him, come closer, clever one. Is this your way to terrify the Argives? No, we are not so innocent of battle, only worsted by the scourge of Zeus. And now your heart's desires to storm our ships, but we have strong arms, too, arms to defend them. Sooner your well-built town shall fall to our assault, taken by storm and plundered. As for yourself, the time is near, I say, when in retreat you'll pray to Father Zeus that your fine team be faster than paired falcons, pulling you Troyward, making a dust cloud boil along the plain. At these words, on the right an eagle soared across the sky. Iaki, the Achaean army cried at this. In splendor Hector shouted, Aias, how you blubber, clumsy ox, what rot you talk? I wish I were as surely all my days a son of Zeus who bears the storm cloud, born to Lady Hera, honored like Athena or like Apollo, as this day will surely bring the Argives woe, to every man. You will be killed among them. Only dare stand up to my long spear. That fair white flesh my spear will cut to pieces, then you'll glut with fat and lean the dogs and carrion birds of the Trojan land. You'll die there by your ships. He finished and led onward. The front rank moved out after him with a wild cry, and from the rear the troops cheered. Facing them, the Argives raised a shout, 
they had not lost their grip on Vela but now braced to meet the Trojan onslaught. Clamor from both sides went up to the pure rays of Zeus in heaven, 